You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome to the Creek Beaks Podcast, Season 7, Episode 297. Man-eating turtle, rat boy, space tomato, UFO history quiz, and Beans Mandela experience. Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome. Uh, it's been a long time. Okay. We did this last year. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see what the year brings. Could be good, could be crap. Okay. Now you never know. So it's kind of a crapshoot. Yeah. Or it seems like it has been the past couple of years. Anyway, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And this is the Creep Geeks Podcast. We do have lots of things to talk about. We are a paranormal and weird news podcast. And this is primarily weird news. Yeah. But we do have uh, a listener submission. So we have a friend in Alaska. Yep. We're going to call him a friend because he seems like a friendly guy. He does. <laughs> no, I, I like Alaska. So anyway, uh, he, he calls us periodically and, and tells us things. And this is one of those times. Yes. And so uh, we did a couple episodes on Mandela Effect throughout our tenure as uh, the, uh, you, you know, your anom- anomalous podcast host. Yes. And so uh, he brought it up. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to save this for a special occasion. And to be honest, I forgot all about it. Oh. And then I found it. Well, <laughs> it, was a, it was a thing. So, but yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. So anyway, uh, we're here. It's a new year. It's a new you. And so hopefully you enjoy uh, listening to the Creep Peaks podcast. Okay. All right. Well, okay. There you go. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Take it easy. No. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> So I found a couple of things I thought were was pretty interesting, and it just seems like this year has been a relatively weird year that we just came through, mm-hmm. um, where it was like much ado. I, the whole thing was to me much ado about nothing. Yes, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff going on that was like you know groundbreaking or anything. There was a whole lot of hey, hey, we got UFO stuff. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna release it, and then it's like okay, and then like oh wait wait, wait. we got some alien bodies. You want to check them out? And then you know, just other things like that. Oh, well, here's a weather balloon. We're gonna. It's a Chinese weather balloon. It's full of spy stuff. I, I hate to use like a a well known tinfoil hat term, but uh, I felt like a lot of the year was the great distraction, but in the sense that it was so overplayed that people just got tired of things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, um, how how many years in a row can you be distracted? And, and not just with like, and then you're shocked when milk is like four dollars for a gallon. You're yeah. like, what? And gas is like six dollars and some. It's come and on. Not man. just with like disclosure is happening, but I felt that way with just the paranormal community in general. Um, you know, we 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 live in a rural area. We do have great TV service, streaming service, though, and we would try to catch some of these newer paranormal shows or you know, watch some of these recommended, recommended paranormal videos people have sent us. And I'm just like, if this ain't something rehashed or, you know, someone would send me a picture and I'm like, not only is that AI, but it's AI drawing on a known hoax. Yeah. It's AI back when it was just called you know? an algorithm. Yeah. And so it, it just felt like there was just so much distraction yeah. that it was oversaturation. And the biggest killer to a community or an interest is actual oversaturation, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. We've been saying that for a while now. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do very many paranormal events, you know, like we did before over the year. And, you know, and, and we you know, we got a couple, uh, well, I got a couple of messages saying, hey, we missed you at this and we missed you at that. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to adjust my mic stand and it's just not working. <laughs> it's weird man it's like everything is just off it's well, like somebody like, comes in here and fiddles somebody comes in here and fiddles with stuff you mean like little gremlins yeah or fairies or something we're probably going to talk about that in one of our next podcast episodes because it seems like at the end of the year mm-hmm. fairy stuff becomes popular again yeah it goes in trends and so it's like oh, well okay. we have a new listener who was really awesome enough to uh share her support of the show with a, a t-shirt a creep geeks t-shirt that she bought oh yeah and uh, she's really interested in puck wedgies. 
So I think yeah, they are delicious. <laughs> I think the combination of like puckwudgies and gremlins more than Fay or the concept of Fay yeah. might be a good episode. So maybe we'll dig into that. Maybe it's yeah. hard to promise these things. Mm. Well, because a lot of the stuff's like I, I don't know. Anyway, you know, it's funny you bring up a a, a listener. Mm-hmm. Uh, I recently found where I could look at our our reviews on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Because I could never really find them before. I mean, I could see them, but I couldn't see them. Yeah. It, which has been a thing because we actually use a, a podcast hosting service and they, they make it pretty easy to be on any podcast player. Mm-hmm. But sometimes getting in and seeing the metrics is, is super hard. Yeah. For whatever reason. So uh, the comment was a uh, great show. Loving the show. Been subscribing and unsubscribing to paranormal shows for years. Finally found a show I prefer over Schrader's. Keep it up. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was like, so when I first read it, it's like, I, th- I read it as I've been subscribing and unsubscribing to your paranormal show. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. But then I had to read it again. And it's like, uh, over Schrader's, which is Dave Schrader, which I like Dave Schrader. So yeah. I thought that was pretty, I'm like, yes, I'm going to put this in the podcast. Uh-huh. So, yeah. But we do appreciate when people tune in and listen, interact with us. We do have a toll free number that you can call. It's absolutely free, courtesy of Google. It's a Roswell area code, and that number is 575 208 4025. Everything we talk about on the Creep Geeks podcast is available in our show notes. So if you check it out and you see the notes that we use, you can click on links and stuff and you can look at them too. Yep. We also have links to like Amazon and junk. So if you want to buy, a, buy something and use our link, it, uh, it allows us to put gas in the albino rhino, which is really not too much of an issue because we don't drive it too many places these days. But it does uh, support the podcast. It doesn't cost anything. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I got to throw it in there, you know, because it's just one of those things. Because we do we do things. Uh, we try to do things. But it's been a little, I don't know. This year for, for me, I felt we didn't do as much. Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel bad about it. Okay. I mean, there was places I wanted to go, but when it really came down to it, it was just like, I don't know. It was weird. It, 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 honestly, it was a weird year. Well, I mean, I think we held back just due to, like, you know, real projects that I had that I had to take care of and obligations I had to take care of. But then just there was an unusual vibe, at least regionally, when it came to, like, the conference and convention circuit. Yeah. And avoiding certain things or some of those frustrations allowed us to focus on other things. Um, I got a new gig. Um, we started to take a look at some of the trips that we want to take, you know, hopefully this year or end of this year, 2024. And when we skipped those events, we were not surprised by the feedback. So. Yeah. Not feedback to us, but feedback about the events that we didn't do. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, everything costs money, right? So it's like, let me get you, let, let's, let's juice up the van and go. Yeah. And it's like $400 later. It's like, wow, I think we could have just went somewhere, you know, yeah. and didn't have to work. I don't know. It, it was a thing. Uh, but I do feel real slightly more energized with 2024. I know that if you're listening and you really don't care, uh, you're like, what are these idiots talking about? Um, uh, we're going to talk about some paranormal stuff, but I think we're going to start off with beans because beans was cool enough to call and leave a message on that toll free number. Talk about the Mandela effect. And he brought up a Mandela effect experience that he had that I re- remember. And I was like, yeah, I remember that too. And so I think we'll, uh, we'll play that for you guys. Now, uh, full disclosure, for some reason, when I recorded his call, it repeated it like five times. So what was like a minute long call became five minutes long. So hopefully I'll catch it. Before okay. it plays it again. Now, if it does play again, because I wasn't fast enough to catch it, it was supposed to be that way. <laughs> All right, so anyway, here we go. All right, that's not it. Hey, guys, it's Beans from Alaska. I just listened to your episode uh, where you talked about the Mandela effect, and I wanted to talk to, about my experience with it a little bit. It, it's not super um, exciting, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm, I've am i always been really skeptical of Mandela effects. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a memory thing as well. I don't really remember, was it spelled tunes or tunes? I, I you know, I, I don't remember all that. But I do have a very distinct memory of seeing a trailer 
for the Sinbad Shazam movie. And the reason I remember it so well is growing up, I was a super big comic book nerd. Before comic book movies and comic books were so popular, like, I was into that stuff. And, like, really, like, religiously so. And I remember seeing the trailer for that movie and thinking, how in the hell did they get the rights for that name through DC? Because Shazam, a.k.a. Captain Marvel, is a DC character. And I remember seeing that trailer just thinking, like, somebody's going to get sued. <laughs> so, so that's one of the, that's one of my big, like, takeaways from the Mandela effect is I, like I said, I've always been really skeptical of it, but I can't really deny what I, I know I experienced. I know I saw that trailer and I remember having those distinct thoughts about how, thoughts about how, like, how in the hell can they use that name? That's not the correct name. And then I never saw, I just saw the trailer. I never saw the movie. And I always just kind of assumed that maybe the movie never got released because of the name, which, I mean, looking back on it now, they would have just changed the name or something. I, I don't know. But, yeah, I I, uh, I don't know what to think about that. It, it just I have a very clear, distinct memory of that because I remember my reaction. I remember thinking, how in the hell did they get the rights to that name? But, um, anyway, thanks, guys. Keep it up. Yeah. Hmm. Now, see, here's the thing. Here's It's a little bit of a different thing for me. Yeah. I remember watching this movie. I do. Yeah. And I, I watched it with, you know, some family members. They were youngsters at the time. Yeah. I remember seeing it and then not being impressed at all, right? But then later on, I seen the movie with Shaq, hmm. where he played a genie. And I'm like, this is a direct ripoff of that crappy Sinbad movie I seen. <laughs> and I was thinking, how can they get away with that? Yeah. And I remember being surprised by the name, you know, uh, Shazam. And I, I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Do you remember seeing it in like 1994 I, or 1996? No, I, it, was, it was a long, long time okay. ago. I remember not seeing it on TV. I don't know if I, I can't remember exactly 100% if it was on TV mm -hmm. or videotape. I think it was on VHS. Because see, I could have sworn I had seen a preview and this harkens back to some childhood stuff, but you know, my dad would always try to take me in Montana to the movies on the weekends and the military theater that was close by. And it was like 99 cent matinees. I remember seeing the, the trailer. I really do because I always tried to make sure my dad would stay awake for the trailers so that he'd have another movie to take us to. So, and you know, so that's why I remember, I could have sworn I've seen this trailer. Yeah. I've seen the you movie. Know? I don't remember a whole lot about it other than just being annoyed that I had to watch the movie. Yeah. So. I don't know. It's, it's pretty weird. So if you guys have seen, I mean, this is, it's actually a pretty popular Mandela effect is the whole Sinbad. Yeah. Aladdin movie or whatever, Shazam movie. Um. I it, it, it just remember it being so cheesy. Yeah, that, that was, was a it thing. Was really cringy. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And that's when I first started thinking that there's movies that a lot of actors make just for pure money. Yeah. They're like, look, man, you know, the agent calls them up and it's like, hey, man, I know it's stupid, but just, dude, you're going to make money. And then sometimes they're like, uh, okay, I'll just go do this and make some money. Mm -hmm. And then and they're genuinely shocked when it becomes a success, if it is a success. It's when they're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like, but yeah, I don't know. So what do you guys think about the Mandela effect? If you have anything that you'd like to submit to the Mandela effect, I don't, what do you call it? Codex of Mandela effects. <laughs> um, uh, just, just whatever, man. Let us know. Yeah. Uh, go to creepgeeks.com, click the contact us form and give your suggestion or your recollection. Or uh, we are trying to get a our Facebook group a little more active, feel free to join that Facebook group and start contributing to the conversation. Yeah. And also you should check out beans podcast and website and stuff. Yeah. It's called alasquatchpodcast.com. And, uh, we had an opportunity to hang out with him and sit on a, a, uh, podcasters panel mm -hmm. at cryptid con a couple of years ago. A uh, pretty cool cat. So. And saw him at uh, Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so we, we do have links to his stuff. So if you can check in the show notes, you can find it there. And you can also find him on Instagram if you look up uh, Alas Squatch. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. 
pretty cool. So I came across this and was thinking to myself, man, are we snoozing on Indiana? <laughs> you know, actually, I say that like every two years because I'll find some creepy story out of Indiana and I'm like, why yeah. am I, why does this sound familiar? And then I'll end up in a Reddit you know, rabbit hole and realize it's 3 a.m. and I should have gone to bed five hours ago. Yeah, there was a show, um, it was a kid's show, I think it was on Nickelodeon, Erie, Indiana, and I never watched it because I was way older than that, but uh, it's kind of the first thing I thought of. It was like, this sounds like something you'd see you know, on I, Erie, Indiana, or whatever the name of that show was. I, I really don't know. I was homesick, and I started watching it because, like, as an adult, you're like, oh, I have to have to watch something while I'm homesick with, like, the That's flu That's what or the price, right, price is right for. I can't, I, I am... An Stop. outlier. You're going to make, you're gonna, no, I'm we don't need the hate. That. I think we but, could um, say Bigfoot is a ghost and nobody would care. But if you say <laughs> that you didn't watch Prices Right when you were sick, people would just get angry. I watched Erie, Indiana, and it had some pretty um, profound stuff in it if you got past the fact it was a kid's show. You're like, yeah. That's, That's how you get indoctrinated. Uh, no, unsettled, as in there was some crazy you know, stuff. No, and they got to ease you into the paranormal. What if all the shows that we see that are paranormal related and just weird and wacky and all that stuff, just, just to, make, to take the edge off? Which is why now so 56% that, of Americans believe in the paranormal. or Yeah, but they don't believe enough to watch it true. or listen to your podcast. <laughs> so, I think you just got to get indoctrinated. So all the computer glitches in the Matrix that happen, you just ignore them because you're like, ooh, that's the paranormal. Not that we're all living in a simulation. Okay. In some sort of tube. Mm. Okay, so uh, evidently the man-eating turtle in Indiana. <laughs> I didn't know it was a thing, but Indiana wildlife officials have D officially debunked the viral tale of the man-eating turtle lurking in lake. Hmm. Yeah. So the uh, wildlife officials in Indiana were forced to issue a statement assuring residents that the viral story of a man-eating turtle lurking in one of the state's lakes was merely, in fact, a tall tale put forward by a clever individual online. Oh. Yeah. So basically this strange case started um, when a, a... vivid Facebook post where it was claimed that a forensic scientist at Purdue University had determined that decapitated human remains discovered in Lake Monroe yeah. were the result of a gruesome attack by a giant snapping turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and so evidently it was a well-crafted story, right? Which even included quotes from a purported forensic biologist dubbed Dr. Eric P or Dr. Eric Paddlejack. Mm-hmm. And of course that quickly spread. You know, like wildfire online until the state wildlife officials had to step in and quash the story. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I read this on coast to coast AM, but it's other places as well. Now, if, if, if they were playing their cards, right, they should have let that story ride for a while. Oh, he did. I mean, the- no, not he, who cares about he, I'm talking about the state officials. Yeah. The Indiana park officials. Hmm. They should just let it ride for about a good two months, three months, maybe. And that way they could get people into the park. So because that's what people want, right? These these state and local parks and stuff. They kind of want people to go to them because if there's if there's a use for the park, chances are they're going to get their budgets. You mean like the completely failed Bigfoot videos from Kentucky that were done by the parks? Yes. And forests and kind of backfired on them. Yeah. Well, they did it wrong, obviously. <laughs> but if they just would have just let, not touched it for a while, you know, it's like hold. <laughs> Hold, we've got to take it down right now. Now, hold, you know, like you see a commercial for whatever it is. Yeah. Now, and then go, hey, guys. And see, I guess part of this does go Because I know if I was a park ranger guy, I'd be like, ooh, yeah, I'd stay away from that place. I mean. Scare him up a little bit. Information spreads too quickly now to create an urban legend. Well, I mean, it just depends. You have to really... I think the way it should go is this. If you're the person who's in charge of that sort of thing, like make, making sure people don't say this place sucks, there's no Wi-Fi in the middle of, you know, whatever, you know, and doing all that, right? The handler, um, you got to check. Like, okay, so I'm seeing it on Facebook. Let me see if I see it other places. Mm-hmm. And then once you see it like four or five other places, like maybe YouTube, TikTok, uh, Threads, X, formerly known as Twitter or whatever, then you say, okay, three days. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it down because there will be people that don't know that it's a fake or, you know, it was a, not a real story that are going to go to that place and going to check it out. I would, if I didn't know that this was a fake and we were in Indiana, we would go there and look at a, a expanse body of water, hoping to see a giant snapping turtle or the beast of Busco. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Or the ghost murderers of, I mean, anyway. well, I mean, okay. Going back to the urban legend thing, there was, 
an Indiana, Indiana folklore story of something called the Beast of Busco, which was this enormous snapping turtle. Citizens claim to have seen it in 1949. And despite a month-long hunt that briefly gained national news, uh, it was never found. Right, which basically makes the idea of a man-eating turtle in another lake, it gives it more credence. Yeah. Because it's the same thing. Hmm. Yeah. So speaking of rat boy, <laughs> so looking in Indiana, there was also a rat boy. It's a bizarre rat boy donated to an Indiana museum. So Bob is like, I'm going to check that out too. No, really what it is, is it's kind of weird looking. Oh, that looks gross. Yeah, it looks like it's made out of old dryer lint. <laughs> Right, paper mache and dry light. So it's a museum in Indiana. They're trying to get to the bottom of a strange mystery that appeared at their doorstep in the form of a, a figure that they've dubbed the Richmond Rat Boy. Yeah. And so it was a, a you know, they, they showcase it like on social media, and it's a peculiar piece. It came in a wooden box dressed to the site. Uh, it was delivered to their back gate, and the creepy figure, and there's pictures of it, mm-hmm. um, Resembles kind of a cryptid, right? Has a creature's head on top of a small humanoid body stretched out inside a container, which is marked Frigili. Yeah. Yeah. And so the museum indicated that the individual who donated the very weird object didn't identify themselves, but did leave a note, which provides some insight into the curious doll's origin story. Oh. So according to the donor, the piece once belonged to their great grandfather's friend who worked for one of the circuses that frequented the area, most likely in the mid 1910s to thirties. Yeah. So the Richmond rat, uh, Richmond rat boy, it probably just got passed off as some sort of kind of monstrous creature, or, you know, kind of like a Fiji mermaid with PT Barnum went around <laughs> doing all that stuff. Um, but yeah, they say uh, the museum revealed that the rat boy is not really a creature at all, but is in fact appears to be made and crafted using plaster of Paris and clay over an armature. Okay. Which is like a bendable frame. Yeah. Yeah. So the body of the beast is said to be decorated not only with paint, but also animal claws and animal hair. Oh. It gives a little touch of realism. And in modern day pictures of the monster may make it hard to fathom how one might believe it was real, but it wasn't at all difficult to believe that the unwitting circus patrons who observed it from a distance over a century ago uh, could walk away thinking they'd seen something crazy. Yeah. Now, planning to add it to their collection of strange things, the museum expressed the hope that the donor might come forward with additional information on the piece, or perhaps a member of the public could shed more light on the doll's undoubtedly unique tale. Yeah. And I agree with them, because even if this is a fake, if you could establish some sort of provenance, like with you know, the, the story that the anonymous donor has given that adds to the cool history of it. So it makes it worthwhile to display. And we are dealing with modern times where people might try to pass something deliberately off as a double fake, you know, Oh, this was something that happened a long time ago. And they pride themselves on making something seem older or crafting it to appear older. Yeah. So, I mean, this could be somebody pulling up like an ultimate prank, or this could just be somebody seeing if they could, you know, pull the wool over this local museum's eyes. Or it could be true where they're like, we've, they found it in a closet or something in grandpa's true. house. Yeah. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, uh, there you go. That's what put Indiana on the map for us at the end of the year <laughs> was a giant snapping turtle decapitating people in the lake, which is, you know, terrible, but you yeah, know, what's that? Right. And rat boy. It's just basically some trash put together to steal you out of your coinage. Okay. So, so speaking of space tomato, I didn't know this was a thing, but evidently this was a thing, and it was a thing for uh, a different reason. Mm. I'll explain it. So, extraterrestrial uh, tomato had been lost in space, was found after eight months. Okay. Yeah. So. Here's the deal. Evidently, in the International Space Station, the first tomato harvested outside of planet Earth was lost inside the space station. It's kind of creepy. No, it's not creepy. It's just kind of like, I mean, how do you lose a tomato, right? But, I mean, everything floats, allegedly. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of disappeared somewhere. So... Uh, the first extraterrestrial tomato that was harvest, harvested eight months ago by astronaut Frank Rubio on the International Space Station, right? This occurred in 2023. Yeah. The 
astronaut recognized that he had lost the fruit. So he lost it. Now, the, the problem with this is, is that a lot of people were getting on him saying, you ate it. Yeah. That's what happened. You <laughs> ate it, right? And he's like, no. So it's kind of a unique story in a way that Rubio told NASA in an interview what had happened to his tomato crop. I put it in a small bag, and one of my teammates was doing a public event for some school children, right, with some school children, uh, and he thought it would be cool to show the kid, you know, the kids, hey, look, this is the first tomato harvested in space. Yeah. And so he said, I was pretty sure I Velcroed it back where it was supposed to be, and I came back and it was gone. Oh. So it's just gone. So Rubio said he probably spent between 8 and 20 hours of his free time looking for that tomato, and unfortunately because of its human nature, a lot of people thought that he ate the tomato. Right, and he was like, I wanted to find it mainly so I could prove it that didn't happen. So he's starting to catch some flack, right? People ribbing him a little bit. So he, he thought it was, you know, sealed up safe and with the Velcro and he lost it. And so he was never able to find a tomato. He returned to um, Earth on 27 September after his stay on the International Space Station with the bitter taste of not only of not having eaten the fruit, but also having not been able to prove that he didn't eat it. Yeah. And so they're like, you know you ate that tomato, right? So, so this is not like a, a high-level thing, yeah. but it's just enough thing to catch crap from your coworkers, right? Yeah. You know you know, you should, you ate that tomato. So here's the thing, though. He returned to the planet and everything, but his stay on the International Space Station lasted more than a year. So he, was, he basically set a record, and he yeah. was the American astronaut who spent the most time in, in a microgravity environment. They didn't say space. Yeah. They say microgravity is weird but and so you know there's, there's also things like you know if you think about it, the international space station's got all sorts of toxic chemicals and stuff in there right he was initially supposed to spend six months on board at iss okay well something happened right and they send people up to renew and you know supplies and all that sort of thing and and evidently there was a a coolant leak in the Russian Soyuz spacecraft that comes up to dock and all that. And that caused a problem. And he had to stay longer than a year. Hmm. So imagine going sweet. My six months is up. I lost that tomato and it's not a big deal. I'm going home and they go, Oh, Hey, wait, uh, can you stay and work an extra six months? We know you were supposed to go home and we, you know, we, didn't, we couldn't really call anybody in to cover your shift because there's a problem. And you're like, what? Can't call out there. What if you said, no, thanks. Yeah. I'm off. <laughs> then they probably would have brought up, well, you lost a tomato. <laughs> and like, I, I'll, I'll send you a check. You know? Check it out of my paycheck. That kind yeah. of thing. Uh, so, yeah, he stayed more than a year. So he remained in space for 371 days. And following the discovery of a coolant leak from his original voyage, right? Mm -hmm. That thing was docked. They were flying in orbit. And then he finally got to go home. And it says, days after splashdown, he said, I allowed myself a day to feel sad and feel sorry for myself. Uh, and then I really had to make a conscientious decision to say, okay, let's all have a good attitude and try to do the best we can. He's talking about when he didn't get to go home. Uh. I had been like, I was pissed <laughs> and very angry for, you know, a week. And then I got over it, right? Because this whole thing was extended for six months. So recently during the press conference, members of the seven person crew on the ISS revealed that they had finally located this space tomato. Okay. Much to the relief of Frank Rubio. Yeah. So he finally gets a little vindication. You know, not only did he lose a tomato, and then, you know, because of a coolant leak, had to stay six more months. Could have been NASA punishing him. So you lost that tomato? Six months for you. <laughs> Straight to jail. <laughs> right. Space jail. Yeah. Rubio had been blamed for quite some time for eating a tomato. Said Astra, uh, NASA astronaut, uh, uh, however you say this person's name, J Jasmine Mogbul. But we could now exonerate him. Oh. So they announced discovery during a commemoration of the 24th, 25th anniversary of the orbiter. In her words, um, basically says, well, we may have found something that someone has been looking for for a very long time. Our good friend, Frank Rubio, who headed home, has been blamed for quite some time for having eaten a tomato, but we can exonerate him. So, oh. yeah. He probably caught so much crap for that. Yeah. Yep. They don't really know what happened exactly. And they didn't reveal where they found the tomato, and they didn't really give any spe uh, specifics about which state it was found in. Like, you know, did this thing rot? Which, you know, you think about I'm it, you're in a micro environment. About. It probably took about eight months for it to start stinking. Uh, yeah, that's what I, yeah. I'm curious. Like, how long would it take for a tomato to go bad? Yeah. Like, you I know? found a tomato that rolled off of something one time. I'm like, what? And it was 
six months this thing was hiding behind yeah. the refrigerator. Oh. So. But then you have, like, other things, like, um, I remember one time finding a potato, and it was still okay. Yeah, potatoes are crazy. They're but like, then, all right, if you're going to leave me alone, I'm going to make my own family. And it starts growing <laughs> itself. And it's like, but, I will take over the planet. Yeah, but then another time I found a potato after just buying potatoes, and it had only been, like, two weeks. Yeah. And it had already started to go bad. I was yeah. Like, when potatoes go bad, it's awful. You're yeah. like, man, this smells it's like a criminal. dead body in here. <laughs> yeah. They go bad, bad. Yeah, they go very it, bad. I don't know. I'm just amused because it's a tomato, and I have a little bit of a nerd plant fascination with it. Not that I'm a plant nerd, but tomatoes started in, like, South America. And relatively speaking, they're a young food compared to other foods. Uh, if you think about the apple, allegedly the apple is like over 750,000 years old. So apples were eaten by known animals, by early humans and stuff like that. But tomatoes only start getting talked about in like the 1400s. Well, for you a know? while they thought they were poisonous. And yeah. And then, you know, by the 1500s, they start actually making their way around the globe. So yeah. it's like. Well, they were called the devil's apple for a while. Yeah. Um, and the fun fact is during some of these earlier times, 1400s, maybe sooner, I don't know, later, I can't remember the exact date. Yeah. Uh, they made a lot of pay- plates and stuff out of pewter. Yes. And pewter causes defects. And you know what nullifies the, the problem with eating off a pewter plate? Tomatine. Yeah, which yes. is in tomatoes. Yeah. but um. So Because what the problem is, is that they would eat the whole tomato plant. Yeah. <laughs> Which has got like cyanide in it. So you don't want to eat the plant. You yeah. want to eat just the tomato. Yeah. So, they're, so they'd cook it all up and like, oh. Yeah. The fact that they'd eat the leaves and stuff, I'm like, mm. Well, I mean, that was yeah. the way you did back then. You know, food is food and you want to eat all of it because you didn't want to waste it. But yeah. you probably didn't want to eat that. So I guess after they had a couple of people kick off or have really bad issues with eating a tomato plant. Yeah. Uh, they were like, don't eat that, man. That'll kill you dead. Just the way that the tomato, though, traveled the world and now it's in space and it was lost at one point. I'm like. Where to go further than space, yeah. you know? <laughs> Microgravity. Yeah. So there you go. That's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, the history of UFO quiz. Yes. I looked at this and put it in here because two reasons. A, I thought it was interesting. And two, we might get some of these right. I'm looking at the first question. Well, don't, whoa, whoa, just stop. See, now people are going to think you're cheating because you do cheat at this. I've seen you cheating before, right? <laughs> I just did a cursory glance and threw the link in the podcast so we could try to take it together. I, I'm trying. I don't think so, I'm going to get... I, I don't think I'm going to get a lot of these right. Well, if we work together... Okay. We can perform lacklusterly on this UFO <laughs> quiz. Okay. I'm just saying, so... All right, so this is the History of UFO Quiz. This is by Higgy Pop, because this weird British paranormal kind of website got some pretty neat stuff. And every once in a while, you find something that's, um, well, interesting. Hmm. All right, so here's the first question. What British, what, I can't talk. What was the British entrepreneur Ray Santilli famous for? Now, here's your choices. Uh-huh. Faking the Roswell autopsy footage, covering up UFO reports within the British government, or the first recorded alien abductee? What is your guess? I'm pretty sure it's not the third one. So You should probably read it. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty just sure. Just tell he, us the one you think it is. Uh, Let's so, make this go by a little faster. Yeah, I don't, don't think he was the first recorded a- alien abductee. So I'm torn between British government and faking. We'll pick one. We don't have all day. Faking Roswell all right. autopsy. Correct. Okay. Cheater. All right. So what was the nickname given to the small metallic spheres and balls of light spotted by pilots during World War II? Oh, I know this one. Okay. We'll say what it is. Foo Fighters. You sure it's not black aircraft or ghost rockets? Yes. Foo Fighters it is. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a picture. It says, where was this famous UFO taken? Hmm. And you have choices. Waikiki, Hawaii, McMinnville, Oregon, or Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it's a black and white grainy photo that just they, looks it, like... It doesn't matter. They can't see it. Okay. They're just listening. Let's just say McMinnville, Oregon. That's what I'm going to say. Yes. That's part of the McMinnville UFO incident. So, now this is a really good one. Everybody should know this if you like UFOs at all. Which term did extraterrestrial... Extra, 
extraterrestrial witness Kenneth Arnold coined in 1947? Is it Gray's unidentified flying object or flying saucer? Um, Don't let me down, let me. Flying saucer. Oh. Good job. <laughs> All right. So uh, here you go. Which U.S. president filed in an official report of a UFO he saw in 1969? Three choices here. Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter. I know this one. Carter. Yep. Correct. Yes. All right. So which Welsh mountain range was the site of an alleged alien crash in 1974 dub, uh, dubbed Raj Welsh, okay. which I think is pretty neat. Um Here's the deal. I don't know any of these. You have Brecon Beacons, Berwyn Mountains, and uh, Clyden Range. I think it's Clyden Range. I have no idea. I think it's Clyden only because that looks Welshish. Yeah. <laughs> and we're the experts of all things Welsh. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we are wrong. Oh. It was the Berwyn Mountains. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, here we go. We're on number seven. So, just hang in there, guys. Mm-hmm. People in the car are like, come on, come on. Right. What is the nearest... <laughs> nearest town to Area 51. The options are Flagstaff, Arizona, Rachel, Nevada, Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, I think this is going to be Rachel, Nevada because Roswell is in New Mexico. Yes. Which is a different state. And Flagstaff is, I don't know, pretty far away. So, Rachel, I am correct. Okay, if both of us don't know this one, we should stop podcasting. Who was abducted by aliens while out working with his lumbering crew? His story was adapted for the 1993 movie Fire in the Sky. So the choices are Jeff Greenhaw, Charles Hall, or our buddy Travis Walton. What are you looking at me for? You, you, you can answer. Travis Walton. Of course. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, we actually know Travis. Yes. And basically, I had hung around him a couple different times at different events and things like that. A few times. Uh, yeah, like six or seven. Yeah. I like it when he gets all fired up when he's doing this. Because, you know, he says, he, he does a presentation where he has to recap a lot of things. and Because a lot of people don't know the story. So it's not like, just because he's said it a thousand times doesn't mean people are listening. And um, So when he gets worked up and starts going on, that's because we'd be sitting there listening to him do his, his uh, conference speech and all that stuff. And it's like, uh, I would pay really close attention when he got all worked up about stuff. Because it was always exciting. And a lot Travis of it is a, has to do with what wasn't depicted in the movie, what was depicted yeah, well in the movie. He's you know. pretty pretty passionate about yeah. what he said and how it was conveyed versus what the movie showed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, fiery Travis Walton. All right, so here we go. Number nine. Which forest in Suffolk, England, is the location of one of the most famous UFO incidents of all time? Now, here's the deal. This is a British website, and this is not one of the most famous incidents of all time. They think it is, but it's not. It's more pop. It's also referred to as um, Britain's Roswell or English's Roswell or something like that. Yeah. All right. So here are your choices: uh, Thetford Forest, Dunwich Forest, or Rendlesham Forest. Rendlesham. Yes, Rendlesham. Click. Oh. Okay. Here we go. Uh, this is this is something. This can cause a, a contentious. Uh, <laughs> what actually crashed in Roswell, New Mexico? In 1947, actually crashed. Is it a weather balloon, a nuclear test monitoring balloon, or flying disc? Now, depending (laughs) on who you ask, all of these are correct. Yes. (laughs) So. I think all of those are correct. Yes. So I don't want to click on anything. Yeah, if it's a balloon, I don't think it was a weather balloon. I think it was a nuclear test monitoring balloon. So. But that may have come later. See, it depends on how you look at all this stuff. There's also a theory that they launched these high-altitude balloons carrying cargo with people, and people were exposed to radiation at high altitude to see what effect it would have on them. Yeah, which is why there was also... Like people with de- defects and maybe people that had were volunteers that were criminals, and so the government was like, hey, we'll take care of your family if you, you know... So it just depends on which horror thing you want, or the, the flying disc. Yeah, or, I, um, you know, something... If it was along the lines of a massive takeout of weather balloons or a massive takeout of <laughs> nuclear test monitoring balloons, it explains nearby crashes like Cuba, New Mexico, and that place in Texas as well. So, well, I, I mean, there's a little bit of a gap in time with that sort of thing, yeah. but I think that 
when they were finally figured out how radar works and we started playing with it, we our radars were um, effective but not safe. So I am going to. I think it just radiated to whatever is flying by. You know. Select nuclear test monitoring balloon. All right. What did you get? I have gotten nine out of ten. Was that correct or incorrect? I got that one correct. Yeah, I think that's this is a garbage question. Yes, because so. the one I got wrong is not good. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. Nine out of ten. Good job. Yeah. And we didn't cheat. <laughs> It'd be easy to cheat, but who cares, right? Just thought it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, I got the Welsh one wrong. That's what I got wrong. Well, so, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty good for a Welsh. Yeah, Welshness. <laughs> So I did look at the paranormal quiz the year 2023, and honestly, most of it's around England. I don't really know anybody huh. that they're referring to. Like, you know, what's the name of the document documentary Ross Allison and Chad Goodwin, who are hosts, were where ghost hunters investigate paranormal activity while in the nude? Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's I, a show. It, evidently, it is. It's a documentary. <laughs> oh no. And I have no idea. But here are your choices, though, if you're still listening. Parasense, The Naked Experiment. Spectral Investigation, Skin Deep. And Ghost Uncovered, The Bare Truth. It has to be that one. Let's see. Incorrect. Parasense, The Naked Experiment. Oh. Okay. You'd think they'd be clever, like The Bare Truth, but no. Okay. Yeah. I don't... Yeah, all of these are very UK-based. Well, yeah, the whole the whole thing is UK based, yeah. so I didn't I didn't really you know. Oh, there is one cool. Which paranormal series was announced to be canceled in twenty twenty three after three seasons? Your options are Ghost Adventures, The Dead Files, or Portals to Hell. Portals to Hell. Yep, because that was the only one that's like at three seasons. Yeah, guess so. what? It came back though. Yeah. Yeah, shocking. So. Well, here's one that you might know. Which Stranger, which Stranger Things star went on to play a ghost named Ernest in Netflix's paranormal film, We Have a Ghost? Oh, I know this one. Well, your choices are Finn Wolfhard, Joe Keery, and David Harbour. David Harbour. There you go. Yeah. Very nice. Huh. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well. well. That's about all I got. Okay, well... I mean, this episode, I didn't want to go too long. I think sometimes we talk entirely too long about nothing, which I did the whole time we were doing this podcast. <laughs> so, so. But I just want to kind of get caught up with some stuff so we can spend some time talking about things that are way more interesting. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I thought uh, the Rat Boy thing would be a lot more interesting than it was. It was really interesting when I put it in there. See, I'm, but it's not. part of it is that we are hitting that lull right now, and we're also hitting – Community wise, we're hitting a bit of a lull where either everything seems over talked or overplayed. And no offense, you're just another opinion. Us, our podcast, included. are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to the audience uh, okay. or listeners. Well, um, so sometimes we'll find something and we want to talk about it. And like you said, by the time we talk about it, you're like, oh, why did I put this in here? Yeah. So for 2024, I would like more suggestions from you guys about stuff to talk about. Um, you know, email us, uh, contact at creepgeese.com or throw it into our Facebook page. That's a lot of work. Our Facebook group. I think people should just give us only the finest quality three to five star reviews. Okay. They can do that too, but they can also provide some suggestions. Anyway, well, I got you here. Here's a suggestion for a new podcast that I think we should work on. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. I'm going to play a little music. I got (laughs) to find some real quick and kind of get into it. Yeah, here we go. This is nice. Ready? That's not so good. Hold on. So, welcome back to Crocs and Socks, a podcast (laughs) where we discuss the pros and cons of wearing socks and Crocs. In today's topic, do you match socks color to your Crocs? Or maybe just wear a white sock? Or are you more prone to a black sock? Are you like a black sock type person? They make you more professional, or do you go all out and wear specialty socks made out of wool from alpacas? Stay with us as we discuss. No, <laughs> no, great, we man. will not. You gotta do it like that. Welcome back to Crocs and Socks, a podcast where we discuss the pros and cons of wearing socks with Crocs. And where did this suggestion come from? It flew into my head, and I was typing it as I was eating a uh, turkey sandwich. <laughs> so I thought it'd be great. Oh no! But the music doesn't really match the energy. I guess I may have to find something different for that. No. All right. 
Anyway. Okay. So. Now, here's the deal. If you guys are like, I'm going to make that podcast, you got to throw us a bone and be like, hey. Yeah. You know, that's a great idea. <laughs> so. That's right. No. Yes. Uh, it's good. We'll we'll uh, we'll hash it out over dinner. No, we won't. And dinner is going to be homemade nachos because we got Taco Bell at home. <laughs> what do you think about that? It's like, oh, you didn't do conventions this year. We have cryptids at home. That's right. We have cryptids at home. <laughs> I lie awake in bed, slept in weeks four a.m. That's right. Me, I ain't got no job. Nothing happened. It's a song by Rat Boy. <laughs> Show me a sign. I'm losing faith. I ain't got much time. All right. Well, anyway, we do appreciate you taking time to listen to the podcast. This is a Creep Geeks podcast, and this was episode 297, episode, uh, or season seven, episode 297. Anyway. Uh, there you go. Anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.